The eureka moment was when uh, one of my students came to me with a map of South Australia showing that a whole gulf had been covered by oyster reefs. It was a startling moment which combined with the realisation that there was this debate in England about how the first steam engines coming to South Australia ought to be modified to tow oyster shell. We're thinking that's impossible. That's thousands, it's hundreds of millions of tonnes of oysters when we didn't have oyster reefs at all. Where were they coming from? They were putting those two things together, which was like, wow, we've just discovered a lost ecosystem. I'm Brittany Williams, a marine ecologist at the University of Adelaide, doing my PhD in using acoustic enrichment to restore shellfish reefs. So this research was playing underwater music to little baby oysters as an acoustic cue to try and attract them to reefs we're trying to restore. And so I ran some experiments in an aquarium where we put a small underwater speaker into the tank that played reef sounds. And these reef sounds are the sounds of snapping shrimp. And this sound indicates a healthy habitat to animals like the little baby oyster. We realised there was an opportunity to see whether or not we could bring them back. I reached out to Oz Oceans, the engineering startup firm, and that's where we came up with the idea of using sound. There's evidence that birds can be attracted to forests by playing music or at least bird noises to bring them back and we thought we could apply this to oyster reefs. This kind of technology has never been developed before so our engineers were up to a huge challenge developing the full software stack and hardware stack to propagate sound across an entire shellfish reef to attract baby oysters and we were able to deploy the very first prototype which we had uh, underwater for a few months and when we pulled up the experiment we could not believe the results. I was calling the researchers at the University of Adelaide to share how excited we were and then that led to further experiments. To be honest I didn't think it would work. I thought it was quite a far shot. It seemed a bit like blue sky research, almost magic. And so I was just pretty amazed when it happened. I had a tank with sound and a tank without sound. Compared the two outcomes and found that we got higher recruitment where there was more sound. But the problem with that was that we had two places in the flip of a coin we could have just got it right by chance alone. So we ended up running a much more detailed experiment to see whether the oysters could chase sound not just up and down but actually chase it across the currents. And again we found that these oysters could detect sound and one of our experiments actually showed that they could swim towards the sound, meaning that they have far greater control over where they go in the water than we previously thought. That was a eureka moment. That was a moment which gave us confidence to think, right, we can invest in the engineering solutions to put them down on the reefs and attract the oyster larvae from out of the water onto those reefs. We're talking about incredibly tiny organisms, just barely visible as a tiny black dot to the naked eye. You need a microscope to actually recognise what you're looking at. Most marine larvae are interpreting a different part of sound, something called particle motion or particle acceleration. And that's as sound waves travel through a medium, through the water, they rattle the particles around them, they rattle them in the direction that that sound is coming from. And that particle rattling is what actually passes through the oyster larvae's body. And then they can follow gradients in that rattling back to the source of the sound. In hindsight, it actually makes a lot of sense because all animals use their senses to detect different things. Like for us on land, vision is quite important to us, but underwater vision isn't as reliable for animals and then chemical cues aren't as reliable either. And so it makes sense that animals use sound in their day-to-day -day lives. 
it was astonishing when we got the first results that we were able to increase recruitment, not double, triple, but a thousand fold. So we found that we could actually restore an oyster reef, not within 20 years, but within about two or three years. There's a thing called shifting baseline syndrome. Uh, we, we think the environment is how it should be by our experiences as, as children. We've forgotten what our temperate coastlines used to be like when we had oyster reefs that carpeted large, large areas providing these ecological foundations for thriving fish communities and crystal clear coastal waters. That's why we need to bring these oyster reefs back because they're a fundamental part of a thriving coastline and a thriving, healthy, productive coastline is a critical component to social well-being. And for us in South Australia, we could probably promise an oyster reef with an election cycle. That's about three or four years. That's a real game changer for those decision makers that would like to venture into helping us when the government had the promise of putting in a reef for fishing. It was going to be an artificial reef, which could be built out of concrete or metal structures or car tyres. And we thought, wow, here's an opportunity to put a living reef back rather than just a artificial reef made out of man-made material. I was able to bring together lots of different people who I could see this would help. So not only was the environment department going to see huge benefits, I knew that we had different politicians who would be excited about it if they heard it. So it wasn't a matter of just talking to one person and convincing them, it was getting a whole community of people. It's wonderful to see the University of Adelaide and the Department for Environment and Water working together on this project alongside the Nature Conservancy. To have a non-government organisation, a university and a government department working together to improve the environment is what we need to see more of. This was something I felt was really tangible. A few million dollars on creating hectares of a restored oyster reef with significant environmental benefit it was quite an easy sell to me. To restore these ecosystems, we put hard substrate down on the sea floor, in this case, rocky boulders, because that's what the oysters need to rejuvenate. So we laid these rocks on the seafloor, but there's no indication that the oysters will actually be able to find where these rocks are. I, I was very worried that we had created a white elephant. People had trusted the science to actually put in the reefs, and it was almost blind faith. Preserving the environment and bringing it back to its former glory is as much about people as it is about the environment. In the context of reef restoration, we've been working on trying to understand why policymakers felt emboldened to take the risks that they did, to go ahead and see if the science that was showing good results in the lab worked in a real life scenario. In an area like the Oyster Reef Initiative, of course, the challenge is that this is a really new thing. It's not been around for 50 or 60 or 70 years. There aren't lots of laws out there that deal with this. So when we're looking at the law that does impact upon these initiatives, a lot of it's not really fit for purpose. So what lawyers can do in this context is evaluate what's there and look at what the scientists need and then say, okay, we are gonna propose a way forward so that the law can adapt to work for this new initiative. I believe that people, organisations, governments have enormous capacity to find solutions to environmental and climate change problems if we have the right tools and if we can sit down and communicate together. Nothing happens without connection and that is fundamentally what has made this project a success. What excited me most was being able to see this low-cost technology in the water producing some amazing results. And here we are today where we have been able to use that technology to be able to boost recruitment to create a successful oyster reef restoration within two, two and a half years of it being put down. That is absolutely extraordinary. 
It's bringing back a system that was completely lost and all the benefits that we would have gotten from that system which is you know cleaner water, improved fish stocks, improved biodiversity, we get that back when we restore things like shellfish reef. You've already got the proof that this can work and make a huge difference. It's made even more difference than we thought it was going to make so our first best case has been amazingly surpassed. I think that we've shown that there is good science that now needs to be replicated in other parts of the world. I think we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. There's so much yet to discover, not only in terms of underwater sound itself and how it behaves, but also how animals are influenced by it, how they detect it. Because we've lost oyster reefs globally and we have ready-made solutions, it seems that oyster reef restoration will be one of the most successful restoration projects anywhere in the world, land or sea.